Well, thank you, Paul, for being part of the experiment. I've uh, been reaching out to people that, um, that also are in the home office at the moment, authors that have written books that have inspired me. And I think at these, in these times, we have to either inspire people or help people. And uh, I wanted to reach out to people that have inspired me, which you're one of them. And uh, it's actually regarding this book <laughs> that you sent to me five years ago. And I should probably tell um, the story behind it because I saw a documentary here in Denmark called Ban the Bus. And uh, that was really inspiring to me. And I, I contacted you via LinkedIn, which was really nice that you immediately responded. Not a lot of people do that. And you even sent me the book on my birthday. So yes, that was a dear present that we've never met before. No. So, um, so I was inspired by that. And I wanted to, first of all, hear, uh, you seem to be uh, world famous in Wales, at least on the UK, yes. under, <laughs> under the name The Business Doctor. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Can you explain to me, how did you get that? Uh, what is your background for that title? <laughs> Yeah, that was the BBC. Uh, so the BBC wanted a catchy uh, name and title for me. It's taken me ages. It's taken me years to shake that title up. Um, okay. you know, Sorry uh, to bring it back. but oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Because, you know, the connotations, the, the, you know, the business doctor, there's something wrong with your, with your company. You need the business doctor to come in and, and help. Right. And um, so it's taken me uh, a while to kind of shake, shake that away. But uh, I'm now called Dr. Paul for some reason. It was really strange. Again, they don't call me Paul. It's, it has to be Dr. Paul. Um, so, which is lovely. It's a kind of, you know, it's a warmth. But, but the, um, yeah, for me, the Band of Boss was, um, it was a series. It was six programs uh, in which, you know, I worked with a small company. I worked with a large. One was a lingerie factory. One was a manufacturing company. And then, and then the hardest one, I think, was, was the, the bin men, um, the, the refuge collections uh, guys. Uh, and it was, it was a challenge by the chief executive who said, this, you know, your idea of working with Frontline and getting rid of managers uh, yeah, because if, if, if we should explain people what this is about, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's in your book, you also talk about wanting to get rid of middle management in order to create high performance teams yes. by, by taking the middle management out, which you did as an experiment, took yes. them out for three months. Yes. And then working with the teams and see if you could improve uh, the performance, yes. which you did, which was hard work. Yes. But, uh, tell me a little bit about the concept, the thoughts behind it, and, and maybe you can explain what happened in, in, yeah. in, in a short uh, yeah. version. Yeah, I mean, in, in very quickly, I mean, when in all our organizations, you know, what we try to do is to take out the, the, the phrase, the thing called management, uh, rather than the people. I mean, we take the people away, we, we kind of retrain them into being leaders and, uh, uh, and, um, and thinkers in the organization. But the idea is to take away the middle managers because they are trying to keep the system static. We take them out and we allow the frontline workers uh, to, to make decisions. And again, this is nothing new. We, we work with military. And in the military, when they meet their customer, their squad of 25 people will all think and, and, uh, and make decisions. That's what we wanted in our public sectors and in our manufacturing companies. So the idea was to um, get them to, to, to work together. And it was really tough. 250 um, um, frontline workers um, who, was, who you know, were... were were part of the structure, were part of the system. They, they were told what to do on a day-to-day -day basis, what to wear, where, where to go, and yet they were the experts. We went, when we took those managers out and we left them to it, um, we went from 30-odd, 40-odd complaints a day to one a week. That was in the first two weeks of operation. It was incredible because the drivers themselves knew the routes. The, the, the people who were you know, putting the rubbish in the back of the, 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 the lorries knew how to do it and do it properly and do it efficiently. They knew even when um, a, a resident, and Mrs. Jones, um, hadn't put the rubbish out, they'd go knock on the door to see if she was okay. They almost became social workers. Um, incredible difference uh, in, into that process. But you know, my theory is quite simple, is to get rid of the stuff that doesn't add value. And, and if you still call yourself in the 21st century manager, if you still you know, write procedures and policies and processes and systems and expect your company to survive, uh, you're in the wrong type of era. That We need agile. We need free thinking. Yes. We need really empowered people now. Um, yeah. And lots of organizations have, have bought into that yeah. uh, since that point. But it's still tough. I mean, in the team... As I saw it in the, you basically created a, a, a mini crisis. There was no question that they were flabbergasted. They didn't know what to do. So it, the immediate reaction was, I don't know what to do. So we're in a kind of a crisis now too. So will this create, uh, 
efficiency later on? Will this create maybe high performing teams? How, how does that relate to the crisis right now? Yeah, no, I think it already has. And, uh, you know, there's a lovely phrase, isn't it? You know, if uh, never waste the good crisis. Uh, and and like, like, like I did, you know, t t well, 15 years ago, I created the crisis. I created, I, I know, and, and I think this is the bit that we're now starting to see in organizations where they're saying, well, these things don't add value. You know, when we look at our national health service, our, our frontline clinicians and, and medical staff, they're not looking for administrators or managers. Uh, they're not looking for processes and procedures. They're actually getting on with what they're good at and what they're trained to do, which is to deliver service to the, to the patient. What they're getting rid of, and my question every day to, to, to organizations, is what are you going to stop doing in order to increase performance? We've been in this kind of, um, I don't know, this, this bottle, this, this, this lovely safe container, creating all of this stuff that doesn't add value. And I think we've now reached a point where that we've got to get rid of that and get back to what it is to be human, what it is. I mean, neuroscience is becoming really valuable now. You know, the understanding of how, what really, how are we motivated as individuals? And it is an individual thing. Uh, how do we really work in teams and teamships? How, you know, how, why um, do we make decisions for some and not for others? So all of these things are now starting to come to the forefront because I think the, the world has changed. We've got to a point where we can't afford environmentally, uh, as well as in our human uh, systems, um, to, to keep doing what we've been doing and expecting something different. It's madness. Yeah. Keep it doing. Now. I always say that any inspiration should come with a provocation. And if yes. I read your book here, um, you're both inspiring people, but you might also provoke people when you say that uh, middle management is a plague <laughs> because yes. sometimes it's unnecessary. And yeah. you're even calling it a global pandemic, uh, which is probably a dangerous thing to write on a book cover. Uh, because right now we're in a pandemic and um, we might joke about it, but it's of course serious stuff. But it, it, as you said, there's a, there's an opportunity in it. So what should companies do if they really want to um, not have your help doing it, but do it, your, do it, do it themselves. So is there any hands on advice you can, what should be the steps in order to maybe rid themselves on uh, from unnecessary jobs? Because that's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, look, the, 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 it is tough for big old co corporations because they have a blueprint of, of what they think an organization should look like. The, the, senior, the, the senior leaders always think, well, if I have these levels of control, then it's going to be a safe organization. And ultimately, they get um, the ultimate responsibility. We have to flip that. The responsibility of running an organization or corporation has to be in the front line. Um, and, and, you know, the middle managers, not, not, we don't necessarily have to get rid of them, uh, but we've got to get rid of their titles. There is no such thing as management or being a manager in the 21st century. The idea is that we have leaders. And I keep asking, um, particularly senior leaders, what's their, what's their role as a, as a senior leader, as a senior you know, chief executive in an organization? And, of course, they come up with we inspire people, we motivate people, uh, we ensure you know, that people are doing a great job. Nobody ever comes up with, my job is to create more leaders. Because the, ro the role of a leader in the 21st century is to create more leaders. They, they have to have leaders all the way throughout their teams and their structures. They, if there's 300 people in their, in their team, there should be 300 leaders ready to step up at any point to take control. Because, you know, as we're seeing with frontline clinicians, uh, cleaners, uh, you know, theatres are now stepping up and taking control of the theatres. Uh, nurses are now taking control of the patients rather than waiting for a clinician. So it, all of that stuff is is really important because I think the important aspect for today is is make a decision. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, you know, it was this is nothing new, but this is this is um, something that we work with in military terms. As Steve Eaton, um, 21 years in special forces, and he turned around and said, you know, when I, I I'm told you make the decision when you meet an enemy or customer, you make a decision and you make it quickly. And if it's the wrong decision and you're still alive, you make another one and you keep making it until you get it right. Uh, and I said, Steve, that's brilliant. He said, because he said, it's brilliant because I would, I do not want my customer or my, or my enemy to make the decisions for me. He said, so it's really important to keep making decisions, but that's something that, again, we've, we've taken away from people, particularly in frontline teams, because we wait for the hierarchy. We wait for the person up to say, what do you think? I don't know, I'll check. And then it goes to a committee. Then it goes into a, another process. We're not in that environment any longer. Um, we have to be you know, quick and speedy. Um, and the other thing that I picked up from the military, which is what I can put into practice, um, is that if I make a decision for my team, I, learn, I, I rob my team of a learning opportunity. 
because yes. they have to go through that process. My job as a, as a team leader or as a, as a manager or as a leader is to, is to keep checking that they know what the boundaries are, they know what the purpose is and, and, and why are they doing it. So you keep questioning. And that's a skill I think we've, that we've not delivered at, at the moment. But it's very easy to flip into an organization. But in the health sector in the UK right now, you're, you're saying exactly now you're actually seeing the behavior that, that is yes. needed on a long-term yes. basis, which yes. we have just seen crisis management, but this should be the general management in future this as should well. Be general. We, we, I think it, it'll be incredibly um, disheartening and disappointing if we go back to the way our health service was run three weeks ago. Um, yeah. You know, because it's hierarchical, it's bureaucratic, it's machine-like driven, and it's not patient driven. It, there is no value added. Whereas now we're in a value added. They are now thinking about the the patient and the crisis and how to put the support mechanisms around that those individual cases. That that's the difference. Then now we, I keep saying to 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 organisations, human beings are not efficient. We will never be efficient. You can never count this as a cost. You can never. Um, you know, see us as a machine. What we are is effective. We get there in different paths. Uh, and that's the, that's, that's the mindset change we have to get into organizations as well. We can be effective. But if you allow us to get into certain ways, and again, it's about relationships, it's about trust, uh, it's about passion, but ultimately purpose. What are we there for? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and another word that I picked from your book is simplexity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because basically um, you... Your message is that you should keep it simple, even in complex organizations. So this is this is also a key word that that caught my attention. Yes, I think uh, again, our job as a leader is to is to make things simple, not 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 to simplify them, but but to allow people to still uh, move forward because everything in the world is complicated. You know, we built laptops that only experts can can help us. Um, you know, rebuild and solve if we have a problem. But, but ultimately, the, the idea is that we're working with human beings. And the word simplexity was to take the, the complicated words and make it simple. And that's why I kind of mashed the words up slightly to make yes. it, you know, to make, let's make the, the complex simple. Let's get people to, to, and if we can do that, we understand our purpose. We understand our why. Because um, if I can keep saying to you, what, you know, what I work with, um, I think it's, um, um, me a company uh, who actually said their sole purpose was to put a ding in the universe um, and I and I thought well, that's not a purpose that's dreadful and of course that it wasn't it was brilliant it was because your job as, as, a, as an IT as a as a coder or something was to make sure you were putting a ding in the universe you were changing something in the world that made a difference to the world and, and I thought oh my word that's phenomenal I seek Uh, entrepreneurs in in um, in uh, in Chandigarh in India, uh, mm. their their purpose was to leave a legacy. Mm. And I said, "Well, come on, there's got to be more to your businesses than that." No, no, it's, that's it to leave a legacy, legacy of good, a legacy which somebody will turn around and say, "Oh, wow, that that you know, you've changed the environment, you've changed society, you've changed my life as a result of doing it." And yeah. at the time, I thought, "No, I, I'm not sure." But it, but at, on, the longer I've been in organizations, I said. Absolutely spot on because people buy into it. It's an energy. Uh, and I keep saying, and I know you mentioned right at the beginning, you know, um, inspiring people. When you inspire somebody, you energize them. Um, and, I, and I keep saying to people, you know, how do I energize a team through distance learning? How do I energize a team that are remote? How do I energize a team? Well, it's just about passion. It's about making sure you keep, you know, asking how they are because uh, ultimately energy starts with you. And I know, you know, in your techniques in terms of breathing, Uh, and, and um, you know, holding, I mean, I couldn't hold my breath for a minute, but I'm sure if with your energy in the room and with your passion, with your instruction, I could hold it for four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, I would, and I'd practice because I'd get, I'd get inspired by you. I'd get kind of infected by your, 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 your change, your belief. And I think that's the bit that we miss again as leaders because if I go in tired, my team are tired. If I go in frustrated, my team will be tired, will be frustrated. It's infectious. And I think the more we understand that we are energy givers, the more we realize, one, we have to look after ourselves. We have to sleep well. We have to drink water. We have to eat properly. We have to exercise in order to keep that energy going, in order to inspire other people. And I think that's, again, fundamental for big organizations to realize people matter, human beings matter, and we have to start thinking like, This isn't a machine. This is a, a group of people. And I keep saying, and I think it's in my book, um, where I want managers to be gardeners. Because um, yes. I think if the more we, we 
see ourselves as gardeners. We're planting flowers, we're watering, we're nurturing, uh, we're you know, getting rid of or moving some weeds. We're, we're looking after a garden, but we don't know whether it's going to rain, it's going to be sunny, the frost is going to come in. Uh, so we're constantly adapting and every day we get up and we look and we become more agile. So gardeners for me are much better and it brings in this kind of softer terminology uh, of being more human. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, thanks that I was allowed to reach out to you and uh, it's very inspiring for me to meet you, even though it's just uh, online right now. Um, it was fantastic <laughs> watching your, uh, your documentary and, and some of my clients that ordered the high performance team trainings I actually told them to watch a documentary, then you don't yeah. need me. <laughs> yeah. um, but of course, we need human people um, to, to, to help uh, taking those steps. But uh, thanks for allowing me to reach out to you. And uh, let's continue these talks another time yes, over a real yes. cup of coffee. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you very much.